be serving with uh, Senator uh, uh, Capito as the uh, majority uh, uh, chair of the uh, Committee on Environment and Public Works. She is our uh, ranking member, and uh, she hosted just a terrific uh, field hearing yesterday in, uh, in West Virginia. And uh, I just want to thank her and her staff again for uh, for your hospitality and for putting together just a wonderful forum as we uh, look forward to uh, providing um, better access to drinking water for people throughout this country and meeting the uh, wastewater treat, uh, treatment needs as, as, as well. Just by, by way of introduction, uh, uh, Senator Capito, I'm also delighted that my, my wingman, uh, Senator Chris Coons, is here. Lisa Long Rochester is going to be speaking uh, later. Uh, at large Congress one is here, and our witnesses are here. We welcome, welcome you all. Uh, Shelly, just as a way of, of introduction, uh, Delaware is the capital of Delaware. It wasn't always the capital of Delaware. In the beginning, there was a place up the road about 40 miles called Newcastle, right in the Delaware River, where William Penn came to this country many, many years ago. And then landed, uh, bringing the uh, deeds to Pennsylvania, what would become Delaware. And after a number of years, the uh, uh, folks here in Delaware decided they want a capital in Dover. And we have had a capital here for a, a long time. We've had a, an Air Force base here for a long time as well. And there's an, an award that's made by the Air Force every uh, every year. It's a Commander in Chief's Award for the best airlift base in on the planet. And Dover Air Force Base, I think, has won it more times than anyone else. And also, you know, the the, the site for the remains of our fallen heroes of uh, when they uh, they come back to this uh, country to be united with their, their family members. We have uh, some businesses here. Of of uh, of uh, we used to have a uh, uh, used to be able to drive into Dover on certain mornings of the week and it smelled like chocolate because we had like a chocolate factory, chocolate pudding factory. We still have the factory and make other things now. And we have, oh gosh, uh, any, any number of businesses that are, that are located here in our state capital. We also have a part of a national park is here and a couple of great uh, state parks as, as, as well. So that's just a, a little bit about, and I'm not, but I'll do it right now. I just also mentioned that uh, the, um, those, before we had uh, governors, we had presidents in the state. And one of our early presidents was a guy named Caesar Rodney. And Caesar Rodney's famous for uh, riding his horse. A couple of days before July 4th, 1776, he rode his horse from Dover, Delaware to uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and cast the tie-breaking vote in favor of the Declaration of Independence. So we're proud of, uh, proud of that as part of our heritage. And on December 7th, 1787, after deliberating for about three days, uh, 25 white guys from all over Delaware had read and debated the uh, what was the draft constitution sentence from Philadelphia, and they, uh, after debate, uh, voted unanimously to ratify the constitution, and thus Delaware became the first state. And it happened literally three miles from where we gathered here today. Uh, and uh, so, a little bit about about us. And uh, I uh, just were thrilled uh, to be holding this uh, this field, and uh, delighted that you could all be uh, be with us. We have actually uh, two panels of, uh, of witnesses. One is a one-woman show. <laughs> it's our at-large congresswoman. <laughs> and uh, she'll be followed by uh, Cassandra Curtis, uh Johnson. Cassandra, would you raise your hand? All right. Thank you. Welcome, Cassandra. Uh, Vicki Puttyman, Vicki, would you raise your hand? Vicki, nice to see you. And uh, Rick Dun uh, Duncan, Rick. I said I, I see Rick almost as much as I see my wife. Not quite as much, but he, he's ever present in my life. <laughs> and I, I think it's a good thing. But we we're delighted that, uh, that uh, you're all here. And um, uh, today we're going to focus on challenges facing our uh, drinking water infrastructure of people in this state, especially particularly in small, uh, rural, disadvantaged communities of Delaware. As the uh, recovering uh, governor, of Delaware, I also said that, uh, and Shelley's dad was the uh, governor three terms of West Virginia. So she's the daughter of a recovering governor. <laughs> but uh, as the uh, former governor of Delaware, I always said that my role, my role was, uh, and is as a United States senator to, create, to help create a nurturing environment for job creation and growth within the first state. And that's a tall order in and of itself, but one that is uh, nearly impossible to achieve without access to clean and reliable drinking water. Um, senator Coons knows as a former county executive and son as a senator. Uh, senator Rogers, who knows as a cabinet member, about many times over, and now as a congresswoman. Businesses don't want to be in places where the, the, the water's not fit to drink. 
and they don't want to be in places where there is not adequate uh, wastewater treatment. So this is an incredibly important element in, uh, as we try to create that nurturing environment for job creation and job preservation. When it comes to, uh, to drinking water, Delawareans face, face a host of contamination issues uh, with water that flows from our taps. A lot of places, most places in Delaware, the water is just fine. And a, a poor majority, vast majority, the water is just fine, but not every place. And that's uh, that's a concern to all of us. From water pipes uh, the, the we, that uh, contain lead to toxic pollutants like uh, PFAS, one of the permanent chemicals that we hear about. Communities need a lot of assistance to address these issues. And fortunately, we, those of us that are up here and here, uh, can help with that. And we're intent on doing that. In Sussex County alone, that's our southernmost uh, county, uh, Shelley's. Uh, one of the largest counties in America. They raise more chickens there than any county in America. Mm. We raise in Delaware 300 chickens for every person who lives in Delaware. So if you're, and we import in the port of Wilmington more bananas than any port in the states, in the country. So you're eating chicken, bananas, where you're, where you're, where you're place. But in Sussex County alone, there's almost 100,000 people. More than half the uh, county's population rely on uh, private wells for their drinking water. And while some homeowners uh, choose this uh, uh, option, other folks live too far from the municipality to, uh, to access uh, public utilities. Some of these uh, Delawareans are finding ex excess contaminants like nitrates, like iron, in the water, which we know can contribute to adverse health impacts. And those health impacts are more likely to affect low-income households who cannot afford a home filtration system. And we can and must do more to help these families. Many families in Delaware and across our country, especially those with young children, are also concerned about the lead in their water. And this potent uh, contaminant uh, leaches into drinking water from, from lead pipes, from faucets and fixtures. In children, low levels of exposure have been linked to damage to the central and peripheral uh, nervous systems, learning disabilities, shorter stat, uh, stature, impaired hearing, and impaired formation and function of uh, blood cells. There is no safe level of lead in drinking water. And while we've not uh, seen lead contaminants in levels anywhere near those in uh, cities like uh, Flint, Michigan, drinking water tests in 20 locations in Delaware since 2012 revealed lead levels above the federal safety threshold. Often, this contamination is found in communities with small systems that can that do not have the sufficient resources to manage their aging water systems. And given the damage that even the smallest amount of lead poisoning can cause, especially in uh, children, we must work to ensure that all communities would have the, uh, the knowledge and resources to replace lead service lines to ensure uh, safe, clean water for their most well, for our most vulnerable citizens. We also have problems in Delaware with well and ground uh, water contamination from toxic forever chemicals like PFOA, like PFAS. We call them forever chemicals because once they enter uh, our body uh, and once they enter our environment, uh, they can take thousands, thousands of years to decompose and break down. Um, we don't have uh, thousands of years to address these issues. We must act quickly to ensure that all citizens in Delaware all citizens in West Virginia and beyond our borders have uh, access to clean, safe drinking water. Uh, together, City Capital and I took significant steps to address these needs through our Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. That bill formed the basis for the Senate's uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which passed the Senate by a strong bipartisan majority. My recollection was it was 89 to 2. Right. 80, we don't pass many bills by 89 <laughs> to 2. They do that in the House, I'm sure. <laughs> 89 to 2. Uh, this um, bill provides billions of dollars for uh, water projects across the country, directly targeting uh, the communities with their most needs, places like uh, Ellendale, just south of us here in Sussex County. It took more than three decades, three decades, for Ellendale to pass a referendum that would allow low-income neighborhoods to connect to a public water system. I'll say that again. It took more than three decades for Ellendale to pass a referendum that would allow low-income neighborhoods to connect <coughs> to a public water system. Funds from this uh, bill will help make sure the milk community has to wait 30 years to have clean water flow from its taps. 
specifically on will provide $55 billion to the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund, the Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund, and the Small and Disadvantaged Community Program, which will help uh, Delaware and other states finance a variety of community and statewide water infrastructure projects through grants and through debt forgiveness. This legislation provided much more funding for the Assistance for Small and Disadvantaged Communities grant program, which improves uh, access to clean, safe drinking water, including the purchase of filtration systems. This grant program targets assistance to uh, disadvantaged communities from across the country. Our bill also provides $15 billion for the removal and uh, replacement of lead pipes, uh, a substantial down payment toward the replacement of all lead pipes in all of our communities. So a friend of mine asked him how he's doing, and he says, compared to what? Compared to what we spent and invested in the past for removal and replacement of lead pipes, $15 billion is a huge amount of money. There's very real need for this kind of uh, communities here in Delaware and West Virginia, uh, where Senator Capito represents and in every state in our nation. Too many of our fellow citizens don't have clean drinking water, and yet they have every right to expect that they and their children would be able to drink freely and safely from their taps. And with this legislation investment it enables, we have the opportunity to right a terrible wrong and meet our moral responsibility to ensure all Americans can trust the water that flows through their faucets. And before I, I yield uh, and turn to uh, uh, our ranking member, Senator Capito, I just want to mention, just close in, with this in mind. Uh, when uh, Wayne Penn showed up and uh, um, landed on uh, by right there in Newcastle, Delaware, about 40 miles north of us, marrying uh, the, uh, the deeds to what would become Pennsylvania and, and Delaware. Most of the people then, and for centuries after that, they would get their water from streams, or they would get their water from the wells that they, that they drill. Uh, over time, uh, we developed uh, municipal uh, wastewater treatment systems, and uh, that was good for some people. Other people continued to drink water from wells and, and, uh, and from streams. The, uh, when, uh, 19, I was 1972, the Clean Water Act was, uh, I, I don't know, it was signed into law, I think it was enacted over Richard Nixon's uh, uh, veto, as I recall. But uh, we began to recreate EPA, and EPA began making grants to states, to communities, for uh, wastewater treatment systems, for drinking water systems. We did that, I think, until about 1987. Ronald Reagan became president. I was in the House. And uh, the, uh, we created a new system. We created for every state two uh, distinct uh, state revolving funds, one of them for drinking water and the other for, uh, for water sanitation for wastewater treatment. And then the federal government would see each of the two revolving funds in all 50 states. The states would have to uh, match those, those dollars. And the, uh, the, the entities in the states, whether utilities or communities or counties or whatever cities, if they uh, borrowed money from the revolving funds, they had to repay the money with, uh, with uh, interest. That worked pretty well uh, for a long time, and it still does. There's the problem. The problem is not every community like Elkdale, like some of the places we visited in West Virginia yesterday, they don't have the ability to repay the money. They just don't have the, they have huge need, they need to draw monies down from those two revolving funds. They don't have the ability to to uh, uh, to repay the money. And the legislation, Senate Capitol and I, did you make sure we did this? And I think I was helpful in that, my staff. Uh, we made sure that uh, communities in distress, communities in need, uh, that simply don't have that wherewithal. They have the ability to get help too, both on the drinking water side and on the wastewater treatment side. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, with whom I'm privileged to lead this uh, this committee. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Carper. Thank all of you for coming. Thank you, Senator Coons. It's always good to see uh, our uh, fellow senators in their home states. Everybody has a little springier step, I must admit, that than when we're trudging the halls of the United States Capitol. So this is my first visit to Dover, Delaware. I've been to Delaware before, but when Senator Carper mentions that uh, the aroma of chocolate used to fill this great city, I can think of a lot of worse things that could happen than to have to wake up and smell chocolate every day. That sounds like a, a dream to me. Um, we did have a wonderful uh, session in, um, in Beckley, West Virginia. Uh, where uh, I'm going to be very interested to see what our similarities are, because I think there are many, because uh, obviously driving over here, the realization that uh, Delaware is a very rural state in many, many ways, uh, and also probably has some of the economic challenges that we have in the state of West Virginia in terms of affordability, 
and uh, how do you build systems and reduce systems that were built 50, 60 years ago uh, to, to meet the challenges of uh, a growing population, but also just aging infrastructure. And so uh, I'm really pleased to be here to hear how Delaware is coping with these problems, and it's great to be here with your representative, Blunt Rochester. Uh, actually, I think we met one other time, but uh, I know of her great service in the House. And so I also want to tell you, you've got, a, uh, you've got two great senators, but I get to see Senator Carper all the time. And uh, he is passionate about what he does. He's dogged in his uh, determination. And uh, he's a great communicator. He, we were just talking about how he calls everybody on their birthday. Um, so that's 99 other people. And then I heard today that it's not just us you're calling. So you must be, you must have had that down by now with the birthday greetings. But anyway, it's very much appreciated. And um, Chuck, Chuck Grassley says to me about every other day, it's not my birthday today. You don't have to call me today. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here with his leadership and, his, and, and the partnership that we, that we share and to see this in his home state. Um, I also want to thank the chairman for his willingness to work and to address these challenges earlier with the bill that he talked about, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. And I won't get into the details and repeat, but I will repeat that we had not only a unanimous vote out of, the, uh, out of our EPW committee, uh, and we have some pretty disparate believing members on that committee. When you can get Bernie Sanders and Jim Enhoff to make the same vote, you're doing something right. And uh, then off the floor at 89 to 2. Um, and this is what this, uh, this bill, this water bill, is what is the basis of what you have heard of and is much discussed as the bipartisan infrastructure package. Uh, and our water bill. Uh, is contained wholly within that bill, verbatim, everything that we passed 89 to 2 out of the Senate. Uh, so it's common, um, the whole package is a common sense bipartisan that uh, let piece of legislation that not just handles water and wastewater, but also roads, bridges, and broadband, which is a very difficult challenge in certain parts of my state, being not mountainous and rural. It's very much of a challenge. So I would like to thank our witnesses for being here today and uh, look forward to hearing their perspectives. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I always uh, he, we talk every week uh, as he's getting ready to either get on the train or he's on the train or he's thinking about getting on the train uh, to come home. Uh, every day Americans rely on the infrastructure that supports our drinking water systems. These are the systems that this nation really has prided itself on. Many of us have traveled all around the world and have seen the things that we take for granted in terms of water are, are, would be, are, are so desperately needed all across not just our country, but around the world. Uh, unfortunately, this nation is facing critical challenges in the resiliency of these systems, and with many of our small and rural communities disproportionately affected by the wide array of water infrastructure challenges. You mentioned some of the chemical challenges, but also in my state, we have an issue with losing the resource because we have aging infrastructure, and by the time it goes from the treatment plant to the home, we've already lost 50% of our water. I think of our friends in California, what they would think about that. Um, I've often wondered, we ought to be building a pipeline out there, <laughs> pipeline in our water. We can make a lot of money on that. Small rural communities are particularly strained and need additional support. Um, but these are not, as I said, unique challenges to just one state. So I'm committed to addressing these challenges that, that we are facing. Reliable, modern water infrastructure is funda a fundamental responsibility of our government. Um, and I think we did address this in our um, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure bill. As he has said, it, it provides lots of funding for new pro programs, but also existing ones, uh, ranging from ensuring that, uh, you, you can imagine who put this one in, systems have pipes that don't leak, there I am, to ensuring that there is a sustainable water workforce, another uh, passion of mine, and um, that can operate and continue new uh, infrastructure investments. We provided a robust, and yes, I'll say it again, amazingly bipartisan piece of legislation that has a lot of toolbox, toolbox of solution and alternatives. So I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you for being so welcoming to me and my staff. I want to thank your staff, uh, Senator Carper, and also the good folks here uh, in the courthouse uh, for accommodating us. And it's my honor to be here with all of you to hear uh, from uh, the great folks in the great state of Delaware. Thank you. Well, thank you for those remarks. Uh, uh, when I was uh, in, the, in the Senate, uh, uh, we had a fellow named Chuck Weston. And the fellow named Scott was 
to a teaching group on the same planets, and they just me that out. So there's a certain one. And uh, they used to meet every week. Like one of the people quite one week. And uh, eventually we started in some shackles and meetings. He told me that I needed to be a good one to work with him. He wouldn't know. And uh, I just, uh, you know, see what I used to do. And we started on an idea, and that's really what we do on a very genuine question. Well, uh, Adam is here. He just stepped out. He's missing his big moment. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> <laughs> William Penn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and in any event, uh, we're uh, uh, thrilled that uh, the Senator Cruz was able to um, adjust his schedule and be with us today. He is an appropriator. We authorize stuff, and uh, but he actually provides the dollars. We can't provide the dollars without the authorization. So it's just hand in glove, and <clears throat> we work. Uh, we work really well. He's got great, great staff. Well, welcome, Chris. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Carper, uh, Ranking Member Capito. Uh, it is an honor uh, to join you and to recognize you and thank you for the remarkable leadership you've both shown in this absolutely essential work together, uh, both the way you've approached it and what you've delivered for the American people. Um, there are things that tie Delaware and West Virginia from Blades to Beckley, from um, Seaford to Parkersburg, parts of our industrial legacy, parts of the challenges that small, rural, and disadvantaged communities face in accessing the workforce, the funding, the infrastructure to actually deliver uh, the safe and accessible, reliable drinking water and the wastewater treatment infrastructure that is critical uh, for our communities. But the way you go about hammering out these solutions is inspiring to the rest of us in the Senate and is a model for how every committee should work. Frankly, if every committee worked as well as the two of you and your staff have worked together, we'd have a whole lot more solutions <laughs> to the problems uh, facing our country. Um, and your leadership on the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act, uh, which authorizes, as you said, $35 billion in critically needed investments, uh, is an absolutely central part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which we hope will soon be a journeying to our president's desk. Uh, to Congressman Blunt Rochester, thank you for your leadership on these issues, and in particular, your legislative leadership in moving the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Act, a truly innovative approach to addressing these key issues. I look forward to hearing from Vicki and Cassandra and Rick. Um, I recognize that uh, my predecessor as County Council President, uh, Stephanie Hansen, now State Senator Stephanie Hansen, an environmental lawyer, is here with us today. I was also encouraged to see Sita Coleman Kamala from the Center for PFAS Solutions here. I just came from Dover Air Force Base. Um, all of us know that we have uh, legacy challenges to address in our country, both in affordability, quality, and access of water. No one could craft better solutions than the chair and ranking member of this important committee. Thank you for your tireless dedication to making uh, the environment, the water, the future better for all of us. I'm really glad you came and said all that. <laughs> Do you need more time? 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you, Senator Coons. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for being our, uh, my wingman, my colleague, and uh, my friend. Um, now I'll get to introduce our first uh, witness, uh, Congresswoman Lisa Plant uh, Rochester. Uh, Lisa uh, represents uh, our state in the United States House of Representatives. She is an assistant whip. Is that are you still an assistant whip? Assistant whip for House uh, Leadership. She sits on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. And uh, what's what's the, the tagline of the Commerce the Committee? What is it? If it moves this energy, if it stays still, it's Congress. We control everything. <laughs> it is former. He was chairman for life. But this is the in the House. I, I served in the House for uh, gosh ten years. I was on a couple of good committees. Uh, Senator Capitol, how long were you in the House? Fourteen. Fourteen years. Wait, are you an appropriate? What did you serve on? I was on bank or uh, uh, financial services yeah. and transportation. Good. All right. Uh, those are good committees. I serve on banking, but the committee that you serve on is the end all be all. So we're really lucky that uh, to have a seat on that on that committee. The committee has broad jurisdiction, as, as the Congresswoman said, over among other things, uh, health care, uh, our environment, commerce, trade, uh, energy policy, telecommunications, manufacturing, consumer protection, and drinking water. To the point today, as the Energy and Commerce Committee's only former statewide health official. Uh, Lisa understands the importance of clean water as it relates to health. Lisa has spent her time uh, energy and commerce working on addressing the disparity in federal services for communities of color and tackling our nation's opioid and addiction epidemic. She's been an amazing addition to the Delaware delegation. We could not ask for a better advocate in the House to meet our state's needs. And uh, we're delighted to be with us today, Lisa. Please Thank you so on. much. Good morning, Chairman Carter. Good morning, Senator. Captain Ranking Member, good morning, Senator Coons. Um, it is truly an honor and a blessing to be here. Uh, Senator Carper mentioned working hand in glove in the Senate, um, but we as a delegation work hand in glove. And as I said, I think um, I think we're the best delegation in the country. No offense, <laughs> Senator Cagher, but I think we're the best delegation in the country, and I am just honored to be here. Um, good morning also to the witnesses, uh, my fellow witnesses. I want to first start off by thanking uh, the two of you, Senator Harper and Senator Capito, for your leadership. Um, it has been mentioned before, but even calling this important hearing, um, I think for many of us in Delaware, but also across the country, this is a great opportunity to speak to the unique challenges that households in small, rural, and disadvantaged communities face every day to secure clean drinking water and wastewater services. I also want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for their strong leadership. It's been said a couple of times, um, you know, your work in a bipartisan manner, uh, work that will really have an impact on the communities across our country as they access these services. Um, it is exemplary, um, as both Senator Coons and has mentioned. Um, I think uh, we all know that if we all worked as well as you two work together and as well as your committee, um, we might even solve world peace. So we, first of all, thank you so much for your leadership. You are a true example, your committee of bipartisan work. This past year, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021, which passed the Senate earlier this year, includes a provision that would establish a pilot program at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to assist low-income communities with their drinking water and wastewater utility bills and help fund upgrades to aging drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. This is an important step to provide long-needed improvements in water quality and accessibility for the communities that need it most. Wastewater accessibility and affordability in the United States had been a mounting crisis for years. I've seen it firsthand in communities across our state. During my time with uh, then Governor Carper, recovering Governor Carper, uh, I had the opportunity to visit small communities that have been struggling with contaminated well water for decades. Towns like Ellendale, a small community in Sussex County with around 500 residents, nitrate, iron and other pollutants in private wells have forced residents in communities such as Ellendale to use bottled water, not only to drink, but to cook, to clean, to bathe. In Delaware, approximately 173,000 residents 
where nearly two in 10 Delawareans use private wells. And in Sussex County, almost half of the county's residents are dependent on private wells. Some communities are in such remote and rural areas that even if they wanted to connect to a public water system, they are unable to do so. Despite this, and even through, through more than 13 million, even though more than 13 million households rely on private wells for their drinking water, the federal government does not provide recommended standards or criteria for private wells. For Ellendale, after fighting for decades for access to clean drinking water, a new public water system that will provide safe, clean, and reliable water to the residents is finally in sight. But the problem doesn't end when a community has access to a private water, a public water system. Water must be affordable. Aging infrastructure and the rising cost of drinking water and wastewater services have culminated in rapidly high rising water bills for public systems. And the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated the problem. In the midst of a public health emergency of unprecedented scale, access to clean drinking water and sanitation services has never been more important. Last month, the Energy and Commerce Committee, on which I am a member, passed a measure to include $500 million to assist low-income households with their drinking water and wastewater bills during the ongoing pandemic. But even after the pandemic ends, low-income households will continue to need assistance. In almost every part of the country, families are struggling to pay their utility bills, a reality that is disproportionately affecting low-wealth communities and communities of color. That's why earlier this year, I introduced H.R. 3293, the Low-Income Water Customer Assistance Programs Act of 2021. This bill would address the complex problem head on by establishing a nationwide permanent program to assist low income households with their drinking water and wastewater bills. I am proud to have introduced this bipartisan, bipartisan, bipartisan legislation Did with my bipartisan? colleague from New York, <laughs> Representative John Katko, and my colleagues from Michigan, Representatives Debbie Dingell and Rashida Tlaib. I was even prouder when the bill passed the House of Representatives earlier this year. This legislation will provide much needed relief to struggling families and give our community water and wastewater systems the reliable revenue stream needed to plan for and afford regular maintenance and upgrades to keep our water and environment safe. Every Delawarean and every American, regardless of race, income, or zip code should have access to clean, safe, reliable, and affordable water. It is a basic right and an essential to public health. But right now, far too many Americans are being deprived of it. We have an opportunity to right that wrong. We have an opportunity to make real and lasting improvements across our drinking water and wastewater systems. Access to water is a fundamental need, and we can and should deliver that to all Americans. I thank you, Senator Carper. I thank you, Senator Capito, for your leadership and for the opportunity to address you today. And I look forward to the, the day when all Americans can have clean, safe, affordable, reliable drinking water and wastewater services. Thank you again. And to that, all God's people say, amen. amen. We have, uh, Senator Capito, we have, uh, and, and Senator Cruz and Lisa, probably two of the most devout uh, members of, of any faith in, in, the, uh, in the Congress. And Chris uh, was an uh, undergraduate major in uh, chemistry, but at uh, Yale he was a double major, divinity and law. And Lisa could be a minister in any church in the state, <laughs> and, uh, and a great one as, as well. But uh, for, for them, for me, uh, as you heard yesterday in West Virginia, the, there's a, a moral imperative the moral imperative that encourages, requires us to address uh, these uh, these issues. And we, uh, I, I quote probably more often than, than I ought to, Matthew 25, when I was thirsty, you give me to drink. And the, the question is, in too many cases, that what we give you to drink, uh, that what comes out of faucets of people throughout the, our, our country, including West Virginia, including too many places in, in, in Delaware, is water that's really not fit, not safe, 
to drink and we have a moral obligation to do something about it and we are bound to determine to do that do that thank you so much for doing it's great to see you look forward to seeing you soon thank you Liz. and with that i think we're going to bring for lunch we'll come back with the witnesses later <laughs> No, not really. I'm going to ask our three witnesses to join us at the table, please. And somebody, we may want to change out the name, the name place, please. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin introducing our witnesses. Cassandra, I'm going to introduce you uh, first. And uh, Cassandra Codes, C O D E S. Oh, where did you get that name? <laughs> oh, sorry, Codes Johnson. Codes? Yes. Codes, okay. Wait, is that a family name? Yes. Okay. All right. Cassandra Codes Johnson, and uh, Associate uh, Deputy Director of the Delaware Division of Public Health. How long do you held that position? I've been with the division for eight years now. Eight, okay. Yes. Definitely. You started right out of school. <laughs> yes, we'll say yes. Good. And uh, in her current role, uh, Cassandra provides oversight for over, is it 700? 700 dedicated public health staff to provide a variety of services to protect and promote the health of the environment, including services that protect the drinking water of our state. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, where did you grow up? Uh, I'm a native New Yorker. Um, where? Long Island, New York. Okay. How did you end up there? Ah, my parents, uh, they retired from working in New York and moved to the great state of Delaware. And I would visit with the grandkids and decided that this was a place where I wanted to raise my kids. Good. So your parents get an assist on the play. That's great. Oh, said thanks. Yeah. Right. Second witness is uh, Vicki Putting. State Manager of the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project in Portland. He has served as the Delaware Maryland State Manager for that organization since, uh, I think, last year, but it's not. It's sure. this year. No, this year. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So you've been, been at this for about four or five months. In this role, she oversees the state a staff of uh, 3,000 technical assistance providers, actually, uh, assistance for that providers, technical assistance providers multiple water and wastewater treatment projects for communities and municipalities across Delaware and Maryland, as well as private well and septic homeowner assistance for both states. We had about, I think one out of six uh, people in households in Delaware get the water out of wells, as I recall. Uh, before joining uh, uh, CERCAP, uh, the, uh, we're joining CERCAP, she served as the town administrator for Blades uh, for the past uh, 11 years, where she managed a number of projects which included installation of backup well to support Blades' two existing wells and address the uh, PFAS contamination in Blades water sources. Blades is a town just in the southwest of Colorado and Bar State near Seaford. Our third witness is uh, Rick Duncan. Rick is the executive director of the Delaware Rural Water Association. 2019, under Rick's leadership, the Delaware Rural Water Association broke ground on their second training facility. Uh, Delaware Rural Water is one of premier training and technical support organizations for small water service operators in the state of Delaware. Rick began his water career in 1983 as a water distribution operator with the uh, town of Rehoboth Beach. And um, the word Rehoboth Beach, not many people know this, but the word Rehoboth uh, in Rehoboth Beach means room for all members, room for all. Uh, in 1997, Rick was hired by the town of Selmyville, not too far from Rehoboth to manage its uh, public works and water filtration and distribution system. In 2000, he was elected as town councilman and for the past 21 years continues to serve in that role, overseeing some of those water facilities, solid waste, local streets and parks and recreation activity. And uh, we want to welcome, warmly welcome each of you here. And it's just thank you from the bottom of our heart for the work that you do with your lives and the leadership that you provide here in this, uh, in this state. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask 
Uh, I can say, would you just leave us off, please? Thank you, ma'am. We'll hear from each of our witnesses and then ask us some questions. Thank please. you. Good morning to the entire Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Thank you, Senator Capito and Senator Carper for holding this hearing. Thank you, Senator Coons, for being here. Thank you, Representative Lisa Brock Rochester for your very important comments. My name is Cassandra Coons Johnson, and I serve as the Associate Deputy Director for the Department of Health and Social Services, Delaware Division of Public Health. The Delaware Division of Public Health, through our Health Systems Protection Section, regulates drinking water and administers the Delaware Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, which um, here from here on out will be referred to as the fund. Each year, the fund, DWSRF, uses federal funds, which have been supplemented with state bond bill funds over the last several years to support drinking water systems improvement throughout Delaware. The fund supports drinking water systems throughout a combination of grants and loans, with funding in the last few years specifically focused on disadvantaged communities as identified by the median household income of a population. The fund typically provides um, some principal forgiveness to any drinking water project that exceeds 1.5% of the median household income as additional support for disadvantaged communities. The Division of Public Health has loaned out, often with 100% principal forgiveness, over $23 million for water infrastructure investments over the last 10 years. As we discuss the work of the fund in helping communities access clean, safe drinking water, I would like to highlight a few recent successes that also illustrate the challenges that communities in Delaware face in accessing clean, safe drinking water. Over the years, the fund helped the town of Georgetown replace water mains and service connections, including lead service lines to improve the quality and consistency of water provided to residents. This fund also allowed Georgetown to upgrade its water treatment facilities, including installation of a new treatment plant in 2012. As one example of public health benefits, the additional treatment funded through these state and federal investments helped to remove trichloroethylene or TCE, a solvent and known carcinogen from the community's drinking water source. This action together with the removal of lead service lines will benefit the public through the reliable delivery, treatment and storage of water for the community of Georgetown. Laurel, Delaware is another example of a community where state and federal funding programs led to public health and safety benefits for residents. Laurel re replaced distribution and service connection lines, including those that contain asbestos. The town upgraded water treatment facilities to remediate high levels of nitrates, a widespread groundwater contaminant, especially in southern Delaware. This is important because nitrate contamination has been linked to health impacts such as thyroid cancer, gastro gastrointestinal issues, miscarriages, and birth defects. Over the years, the town of Milton used resources from the fund to replace water main pipes create loops within the pipe system and eliminate dead ends to reduce the amount of water remaining in lines for extended periods with improved water quality. The town has also provided treatment upgrades at the water treatment facility, as well as help citizens that cannot connect to the public water system upgrade or install private wells. In the spring of 2010, the city of Seaford utilized state and federal funds for a distribution system improvement project that allowed private well owners to connect to the public water system. Well owners often face nitrates and other natural contaminants, but can also be impacted by environmental releases, surface contamination, and other factors that impact safety and quality of their drinking water. Compounding the issue, traditional DWSRF funding is often precluded from assisting homeowners with the financial burden of connecting to a nearby system. The distribution system improvement project allowed the state to provide federal disadvantaged community additional subsidy, essentially paying for half of the project costs. The projects described have benefited approximately 24,000 Delawareans, almost half of which are persons of color. And many of the projects highlighted are located in rural areas of Delaware. Many rural communities, lower wealth communities, indigenous communities, and communities of color often face greater numbers of or more dangerous hazards than other communities. The multiple hazards can then aggregate to amplify harmful health impacts on these communities. These cumulative impacts can affect multiple generations and place additional weight on already overburdened communities. These communities are often referred to as environmental justice communities. In Delaware, we are working really hard to address these inequities, but require support in this effort by the federal government. 
the President's Environmental Justice 40, initi 40 Initiative sets the lofty but necessary goal of making sure that 40% of all federal funding is used to provide assistance to environmental justice communities that have long suffered from historic underinvestment in infrastructure, including water infrastructure. We support the passage of the President's Build Back Better agenda, which includes the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021, as well as additional funding for water infra infrastructure projects, lead and PFAS remediation, and support for small, rural, and disadvantaged communities. Specifically, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021 supports these communities by authorizing more than $35 billion for water resource development projects across the country, with a focus on upgrading aging infrastructure, addressing the threat of climate change, investing in new technologies, and providing assistance to marginalized communities. In closing, I would like to thank the entire U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee for working to invest in our nation's water infrastructure with a focus on equity and look forward to continuing to work with you all to better meet the drinking water needs of the people of Delaware. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Vicki Crane, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito. I want to make sure your mic is, is, it, is it on. Is that better? Oh, you can hear me now? Line. There yes. we go. Good. Sorry. Uh, thank we you, want Chairman. To hear everyone. <laughs> thank you, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito, Senator Coons, for this opportunity to address the needs of water systems in small, rural, and tribal communities. My name is Vicki Prettyman, and I'm the Delaware and Maryland State Manager for SIRCAP, the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project. I'm sorry. SIRCAP is. SIRCAP is a technical assistance um, from SIRCAP serves Delaware all the way down to Florida. We help rural and small communities um, with water and wastewater, stormwater needs. Good, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project, we are the regional partner of our Rural Community Assistance Partnership. Last year, our CAP served more than 3.4 million rural and tribal residents, more than 2,000 of the smallest, most distressed communities, including 46 active projects in Maryland and Delaware. Water and sewer service is a driving factor for economic growth. The, of the approximately 150,000 public water systems across the country, 97% serve small communities and 72% serve communities of 500 or less. Small communities are challenged by the ever-increasing cost of operations over smaller, sometimes dwindling customer base. COVID has further exacerbated the challenges rural communities face, with many suffering a significant drop in revenue when employers shut down businesses and some customers were unable to pay their bills. With the mounting financial losses, communities were forced to defer infrastructure projects, adding to the more than one trillion that EPA estimates the water sector needs. The burden largely falls on communities, with federal funding reduced from 63% 59 years ago to 3.5% today. Small systems in our two states cope with COVID and reduced revenue in a variety of ways. One Delaware town estimated its revenue loss of $375,000 per month and requested temporary forbearance on their USDA loans. While it's safe to say that all systems suffered some impact of COVID, it hit the small systems the hardest. There were there are many rural communities that are not connected to wastewater systems at all, resulting in raw sewage in yards and waterways, contaminated drinking water for residents, and the threat of associated diseases, trapping people in a vicious cycle of poverty. I want to thank Senators Capito, Booker, and former Senator Jones for introducing a bill that would create a grant program to address these challenges. There's great need in rural communities for a permanent nationwide low-income customer assistance program. A pilot program was included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 
but a 40 utility pilot program, 10 being small community systems, doesn't begin to address the need for low income families nationwide. We have assistance programs for low income Americans for food, shelter, heat, and health care, but no such program for water. I thank Representative Blunt Rochester with her work with Representative Kako, along with Senators Cardin and Wicker for introducing bipartisan legislation. And thank you, Senators Carper and Capito, for your leadership. While we are sincerely grateful for all the hard work you have done advocating for this program's inclusion, we urge the committee to create a nationwide permanent program housed at EPA in the budget reconciliation package. Civic and religious charity organizations are seeing a decrease in corporate and personal donations, but an increase in requests for assistance, particularly assistance to pay utility bills. The basic need, uh, particularly assistance to pay water bills uh, after the shutoff moratorium was listed, lifted. The basic need for water has never been more highlighted as it has been during this pandemic. A Delaware nonprofit focusing on the needs of our most marginalized community members saw requests for assistance with water bills more than double. Before COVID requests for, requests for assistance to pay water bill of $60, now they're seeing requests to pay water bills of 600 or more to avoid being shut off. Water systems are universally concerned about emerging contaminants. The many compounds that fall under the umbrella of PFAS have already been detected in a couple of locations in Delaware. I happen to have been the town administrator of one of those towns. The town was helped out financially and te technically by state and federal agencies, but once the public health crisis was resolved with a new filtration system, the cost of operating and maintaining that system resides solely with the town. For a town of about 1,500 residents, a poverty rate of more than 22%, this can be a crushing burden indeed. Replacement of the filter media alone can cost more than $30,000 and a task that is required every three, could be required every three to six years. There is an added issue of disposal of the old media as hazardous waste and increased operations cost of the new treatment system. Our citizens should not bear the financial burden and increase to their water bills due to remediation of these pollutants. Federal investment is needed to address these emerging issues. CERCAP works with communities and partners across Delaware and Maryland and the entire Southeast US to advocate for and generate economic opportunities and improved quality of life in rural areas. The services provided through these programs deliver critical assistance in the small and disadvantaged communities where it is most needed. I thank the committee for inviting me to testify today and look forward to working with you and more and your colleagues to ensure these important priorities are passed into law. I'll leave you with this one quote from former U.S. Surgeon General in 1952. Water is essential to life, the life of a city as well as the life of human beings. Without water, a person dies. Without water, a community faces the same fate. Thank you very much. Well, who was the Surgeon General in 1952? Go ahead. You can make it up. We won't know. Writing that down, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Oh, well, while Rick's testifying, well, I'm you? sure you can find Weren't it. Were you the Surgeon General? Then? <laughs> I was an admiral, not a general. <laughs> no, I was not an admiral. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With that, Rick, there's two, two, two tough acts to follow you. I'm sure you're up to it. So Follow please, please proceed. Delighted that you're here. Thank you. Well, good morning. Welcome to Senator Castro in Delaware. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Carper, Senator Coons. Good to see you again. I think we met last at the uh, opening of our aeration treatment plant in Subville years ago, so we look forward to it. It's an honor to appear before you today and have the U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works hold its field office hearings here in Dover to talk about Delaware water issues. 
I am Rick Duncan, the executive director of the Delaware Rural Water Association, where I've enjoyed working for my past 31 years. As Senator uh, Carper said, I'm also an elected official for the past 22 years in the town of Selberville, which is a small municipality 55 miles south of Dover here. Delaware Rural Water is a nonprofit association of small rural communities with over 240 members. Our critical part of our mission at the Rural Water Association is to travel directly into all small rural communities and assist them with operating, governing, financing, upgrading, and maintaining their water and wastewater infrastructure. This includes in compliance with the abundance of federal Clean Water and Safe Water Act regulations, as well as all the training needed to keep local officials, operators certified, and educated on the latest rules, regulations, and technologies. It would not be an exaggeration to say that I have traveled to every community water system in the state and mostly all the public water systems providing on-site hands-on technical assistance over my 31 years. And I have done this probably more than one time. Delaware has 482 public water systems, of which 207 are community water systems. Only three of these water utilities serve populations of over 100,000 people and only 34 serve a population between 3,300 and 10,000. That means 448 of these total 482 public water systems serve fewer than 3,300 persons. Small rural communities have more difficulty affording public drinking water and wastewater service due to the lack of population density and the lack of economic of scale. This challenge is compounded by the fact that rural communities have lower average medium household incomes and often have higher rates of poverty. Many small communities have only one operator with multiple duties, not just water treatment. While a large community may have a team of technical experts, including engineers, chemists, and highly trained operators as part of the full-time staff. On behalf of all the small rural communities in the state, thank you, Senator Carper, Senator Capito, for crafting and passing in the Senate the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. We enthusiastically support enactment of the bill and appreciate the many helpful and beneficial provisions for rural America in your water legislation, including the expansion of technical assistance and grants targeted to communities with the greatest needs, which should help us address rural environmental justice, sustainability of water infrastructure, protecting the public from PFAS contamination, compliance with the new lead and copper rule revisions, reducing nutrient concentrations into source water, improving the country's water workforce, defending against cyber attacks on water supplies and other priorities. The town of Selbuva and municipalities in Delaware would like to sincerely thank Congress for funding we received under the 1.9 trillion American Rescue Act. Selbuva received approximately 1.4 million from this legislation. We will be using a significant portion of this funding for drinking water and wastewater infrastructure updates, including a new storage facility, filter backwash recovery, and other urgent needs. The main concern in Delaware's small and disadvantaged communities is aging water infrastructure. Much of the water infrastructure around the state is many dec decades old and experiencing chronic failures causing non-compliance. Pipe materials have reached their intended use age and are crumbling and failing. This deterioration is occurring while we are witnessing dynamic increases in the cost of materials like pipe, hydrants, meters, fixtures, and treatment chemicals. This adverse trend is compounded by another problematic trend. Our communities cannot fill their demand for new water and wastewater operators. We need help. Our experience in Subway is similar to many small rural communities in the state. Unfortunately, many are smaller, including numerous mobile home parks, where due to the limited economic of scale, there is no ability to solve their water infrastructure challenges without grant rich subsidies. In addition to funding assistance through state revolving funds, small rural communities need help with hands-on technical assistance and training with funding applications, understanding all the complicated EPA rules, including the new lead and copper rule and training of new operators. Lack of water and wastewater operators in the workforce remains one of the most troubling trends in Delaware. We have many experienced operators retiring and very few new operators coming into the field. Currently, Delaware Rural Water collaborates with Polytech and the state's pathway education programs to train high school students who are not college bound to be trained in basic water operations. This has been a great success for us here at Delaware Rural Water. And today, 
we welcome William Penn High School, which has joined us with rural watering and our training program for high school students. Rural Water is, a, is grateful for the 55 billion in water funding and the bipartisan infrastructure framework legislation, which is more EPA water infrastructure funding than anyone could imagine. Rural Water is committed to working with the state agencies and moving the funding out into projects and helping all the communities in Delaware to apply and secure the funding. It will be a quite be welcome challenge to move the funding from program dollars to approved projects. Rural Water foresees a great demand for on-site technical assistance in the application process, project design, the education, the new funding for all the state's rural communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the honor to testify for Rural America. And we are grateful that you have included a voice for Rural America at this hearing. In addition, we deeply appreciate the numerous opportunities this committee has provided rural America to be included in crafting of federal water environmental legislation and the policy. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, very, very much for, for all you do, and uh, certainly for being here today and sharing those thoughts with us. Senator Cruz had modified his schedule in order to be able to join us here for, for an hour. I just want to say a thank you, not just for being here, but to being where we really need you on the especially the appropriations committee. <laughs> make sure that the, the work that uh, Senator Capito and I are doing with our colleagues on our committee, uh, you know, we can we can authorize programs, authorize spending from now until the cows come home or the chickens come home. And uh, and it, it, it will be for naught if we don't have the appropriations. And uh, Senator Coons delivers. So thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you, um, Ranking Member Capito. And, and thank you uh, to the witnesses who've spoken uh, so movingly about the urgent need for more funding, for more technical assistance, for more training and a, a stronger workforce. When I was county executive, I was responsible for a, a wastewater treatment system that served half a million people and had 1,800 miles of sanitary sewer and 75 lift stations. And we did have that team of engineers and technical advisors. Uh, the challenges that you face in rural and disadvantaged communities um, is far greater than I had previously appreciated. So I'm grateful for your testimony. Thank you so much you. for accommodating me and allowing me to join you today. And I look forward to funding anything that you appropriate now and into the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, Senator Capito, uh, would you like to lead us out? Let me just mention something, if, if I can, while, while Rick is sitting here. He's uh, from Selden, elected for 21 years, did you say? Uh, there's uh, one of the things that uh, is different from Delaware than when I first came here a million years ago, right out of the Navy. But one of the things that's uh, different is we've become, people come here for, our, for a variety of reasons, as tourists, uh, national park, uh, uh, wildlife refuges, people come here for our beaches, uh, people come here because we have a tax-free shopping. But one of the things that increasingly people come here for is because of music. And it's, uh, it's like uh, two weeks, I was two weeks ago, we had the Firefly concert just up the road at the uh, Dover Downs. I think there's 75,000 people here. It's about the 10th year that we've done it. We've had huge acts like you know, Paul McCartney, just some of the biggest acts in, in the country. The, uh, we have, you can find from all the way down to, uh, all the way north to uh, uh, Wilmington, the Grand Opera House, the Freeman Stage, University of Delaware Carpenter Hall, which is all up and down, including here in, in, in Dover, Selbyville. Has, there's a place called Freeman Stage. Take, uh, take just a second. I, my recollection is something magical is happening at Freeman Stage in terms of the, uh, they, they can, 1,500 people, like they can show up in the summers from Memorial Day through Labor Day for concerts, some of the biggest acts around. And uh, But I think they're building, uh, creating a uh, something like a pavilion or something really exciting. What, would you just take a minute on that, Rick? Uh, Freeman Stage is, uh, we attended several concerts, but it's a great uh, addition to uh, in some of us, it draws and attracts a lot of people and stuff like that. So they, they host a lot of good events there and stuff like that. So it's, um, we welcome them as, as much as we can. So they, they provide great shows. We will uh, come to our beaches and they're good ones. We have, we have some of the cleanest, loveliest beaches around. And the folks like to shop and we have good, good food, but uh, music. And I think they're going to be able to see 4,500 people at the uh, the Freeman State stage in the next development, and uh, you, know, you recall the uh, Save Our Stages, the Save, Save Our Stages legislation, which is designed to help uh, 
um, especially music venues that were hard hit by the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. And one of them was helped is uh, Freeland Stage. So we're delighted they're in business, up and running, up still around, providing yeah. great, uh, great entertainment. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to yield to Senator Capito for uh, for uh, first round of questions, and we'll just take it from there. So. Thank you. Thank all of you. Very interesting perspectives. Uh, a lot of similarities and a few uh, few differences, uh, and probably um, many more similarities between our two states. And thank you for what you do for the citizens of Delaware. Uh, let me ask a question of um, Ms. Coach Johnson. On the um, on the health perspectives in the PFOS area, have have you had to um, and led? I want to know what is the pervasiveness of this in Delaware, as far as you know, and um, is are lead pipes a big issue here? And and what are you seeing there? Um, yes, yeah, so I can respond um, more in detail uh, on the record later for that. But yes, we do have a problem with lead pipes here in Delaware, again, due to aging infrastructure, right, in certain uh, communities. Um, and we have a, a pretty robust um, um, lead program, right, to actually do testing. State program? State program, mm -hmm. state funded um, lead program to help with, with testing um, of kids, right, to actually mm -hmm. be able to determine and catch early, um, you know, levels Have you of found that that's an issue? I mean, obviously with Flint, Michigan, that's that was a big issue. You found finding that it's high, low, or it, it seems to be uh, something that's been managed. Um, we do have a, a issue um, with lead for kids here yeah. in Delaware that we're okay. working that's really hard to address. And I know Senator Hansen, who's also here and others, um, are really um, helping to, to lead that issue. There is, um, a legislative body here in Delaware that is looking um, at the lead issue. Um, there's a, um, a, a committee that is established um, by the governor that is working on looking at um, how we can strengthen both um, the testing and remediation for lead for kids here okay. in Delaware. Good, thank you. I would just FYI, uh, those of you who are interested in the PFAS issue, and there's some in the audience that are interested in that, we're gonna be having a hearing on that in uh, next week, I believe. Uh, with Radhika Fox, who is uh, in charge of those issues. Both the chairman and I have been very aggressive on that in terms of pushing for some kind of drinking, uh, safe drinking level. <clears throat> and hopefully we're going to get some more definitive uh, answers from the EPA. That's, that, that's been something that's a lot of interest everywhere, but certainly for the two of us, uh, most assuredly. Let me ask you, Mr. Duncan, uh, just so I understand the structure here, I know what our structure, you have all these rural systems, you have a couple big systems. Um, do you have like public service districts like we have in West Virginia or who runs those rural services? Are they municipalities? Or, uh, I know you only have three counties. Uh, have their um, uh, areas, service areas. Uh, we also have uh, privately owned, which is under the PSC, okay. the Public Service Commission. So right. That, so. so when you're putting together an improvement, and um, we talked about the cost of all of this. When you're putting together a system that needs improved, uh, we have a uh, infrastructure and jobs council that sort of ranks these and then tries to pull funding from EDA and, and U, uh, uh, USDA and all this, uh, to, because not one entity can, can afford all of this, the cost of one. I mean, some of them can, but not normally in rural areas. Um, do you have that kind of a system here in Delaware where you, have a coordinating body that helps to get to the affordability because what i'm trying to get to is the area the issue of raising rates is as is big an issue in delaware as it is in west virginia and certainly at the lower end it's got to be but just in general our communities haven't raised their rates many of them for many 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 years as a council person, we never want to raise rates, but we right, have of to. course you don't. We yeah. don't want to, and, and so it doesn't get us elected. So, very, but we do have the Water Infrastructure Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a program set aside there that we can uh, offset funding for water and wastewater utilities to uh, do a uh, an asset management program, capital improvements program, stuff like that, to help offset some of those and see where the needs are uh, for rate recovery. Uh, capital improvements and so forth like that. So, on the um, uh, you mentioned uh, asset management issue, that's something that uh, the chairman and I 
uh, dealt with in this in this bill to, so that you can identify where your assets are. Some of, okay, I know I'm in the first city of the first state, right? No, the Lewis was the first town. Oh, oh, years, okay. Four, Sorry, I got the that wrong. Lewis, that gentleman right there. Will be upset if we I know that. he's right there. Sorry. <laughs> um, the the a, a city in the first state. How about that? Uh, but some of your infrastructure's got to be very very old because you've obviously developed early uh, as as a state. Do you have a pretty good idea of where all your infrastructure is? I mean, I know it's a small state, but I'd be interested to know, particularly in the rural areas, if this asset management piece that we put in is going to be of help to, to Delaware. Uh, the Office of Drinking Water uh, several years ago uh, had a subcontractor uh, work with rural water and other agencies to uh, hopefully identify a lot of these uh, to go out and uh, study every town and municipality mm -hmm. and just find out what that figure was going to cost and where all the, the aging infrastructure was so that uh, a lot of our municipalities has taken advantage of the, uh, the the grants that they can get through the uh, water infrastructure advisory council to uh, to narrow the scope down i guess uh, what they need so yes but there's still a need there for there's always a need. more delineations yeah, and clarity. It, you can't see what's buried. So no. I mean, there's a lot of work uh, trying to identify where these pipes are without right. going test holes and stuff like that. So it's, it's a big number, you know, right. to do that. So. Right. Um, Ms. Coase Johnson, what would you say your biggest challenges are uh, from the public health? I mean, we, we talked about lead, we talked about PFOS, but is there anything else there that uh, Obviously, lack of drinking water. I mean, obviously, it's got to impact uh, education and younger children, um, ability to economically develop certain areas. Do you have, uh, do you want to expound on that a little bit from the public health perspective? Um, it was mentioned um, earlier, I think, in Representative Lisa Bob Rochester's uh, comments, and also I think others have talked about this. Um, we um, are very concerned um, about our private well owners um, here here in our state um, and um, how we can um, support them because oftentimes they don't live close enough to get drinking water from a public, right, from a public utility. Um, and the inability to have access to that public um, source of water means that there's no mandatory monitoring, right, or treatment um, for any contaminants, right, that may be in that water. So, and you know, when we promote um, recommendations for inexpensive well testing and, and things of that nature, but um, really less than 2%, we're seeing of people with private wells actually you know, do that um, on a on a regular basis, um, and so private well contaminants um, affect low income and environmental justice communities. We know, right, at a disproportionate um, rate. And in the same token, um, you know, these residents often often struggle to be able to afford the bottled water that they need, right, on a daily right. basis to support their families. So that that's a challenge that we see, and we um, think things like promoting regionalization, you know, where, where we can and offering well rehabilitation services and more education mm -hmm. um, for private well, well owners um, in our rural parts of the state um, are, are some things um, in addition to maintaining the disadvantaged community um, additional substances are substances subsidies are necessary mm -hmm. to help um, in that area. Well, as part of this bill that we've been talking about uh, that we hope gets to the president's desk soon. Uh, as part of the bigger infrastructure package, we did put, I believe, $50 million into uh, decentralized systems, uh, such as what you're talking about. But um, where I was coming from, this was with Senator Booker. Um, it it, it kind of surprised me, being from what I consider a very rural state. He has impressed upon me that uh, New Jersey still has very, very rural areas, which I'm sure that they do. But you know, we got these septic systems that have been around for way too long. They can't be replaced. Well, they could be replaced, but too expensive to be replaced. So this will have some assistance with that to be able to hit exactly what you're talking. These systems that don't aren't connected to anybody, um, and um, and and to be able to give some assistance through the state to that individual resident, rather than to a municipality or a, or a county system. So you said one word that we heard a lot yesterday, and it's hard in a small state because we um, we take ownership of all of our small communities. Every 
Now, you know, you mentioned you're on the city council of your small community. There's a lot of pride there. So it's hard to say we need to regionalize because you feel like you're going to give up your governance or your ability to make decisions for your own citizens. But, you know, to get more bang for your buck, that's really the, the way to go. And, uh, and certainly with the technology as it's moving forward, you can maybe help a little bit with the workforce issue if you can regionalize and, and then have your technical expertise or even if you went into more, um, um, more modern ways of monitoring than, than the old meters and everything that we used to have or we still have, um, I think that could be uh, a, a, a way for uh, rural America to really um, be more effective in this area. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Kaplan, thank you so much. Senator Kaplan has been a leader on uh, PFAS, default from the chemicals, clean water, clean drinking water standards, and, and uh, continues to do that. And I'm privileged to uh, to, to help uh, with that. I um, Every now and then people are probably hearing a, a noise outside, like overhead. Uh, we have a couple of, we have two uh, kinds of airplanes at Dover Air Force Base, which is just down the street. Uh, one of them is a C-17, more modern aircraft, and a big plane, but the much bigger plane is a C-5. A C-5 carries uh, twice as much as a C. Uh, a C-17 flies twice as far. Actually, carries three times as much, I think. So uh, well, I think what we're hearing is C-5s flying so fly the, in, fly in the balance pattern and flying overhead. Um, I was uh, about gosh, seven, eight years ago, um, Sir Capital, I was uh, driving literally right by this building on my way to Southern Delaware coming right down the, uh, the uh, route to 113. And uh, there was a, a traffic backup and uh, about a half mile north of the base. And I, I wonder what this is. And I got a phone call from my staff on my cell phone and said, uh, C-5 has gone in, uh, crashed just south of the base. And what happened is uh, the, one of the largest airplanes in the world, C-5 owns more air, aircraft records, I think, than any aircraft in the world. And they're incredibly reliable aircraft. But human air, I've spent a lot of years of my life in, as a naval flight officer. And C5 was, uh, they're getting ready to fly, I think, uh, over the top of the world in, in the land, and maybe in Afghanistan with a full full bag of, of fuel, a full, full load of cargo. And uh, as they have four, the C5 has four engines. And C5, they pre flighted, they loaded the plane, gassed, gassed up, and they were taxiing, got the clearance, and down the runway, hit refusal speed, took off. And as they climbed out, the, uh, uh, one of the things that the uh, flight engineer checks on is uh, engine warning lights to make sure the four engines are okay. And the, uh, the, they got out of the four engines, they got one engine warning light, which is not good. And the flight engineer, rather than turning off, shutting down that engine, shut down the wrong engine. And uh, uh, a plane that was flying with a full bag of fuel, full load of cargo, instead of flying on four engines, all of a sudden was flying on two. And they tried, uh, as hard as they could to get back around to come back and try to land on the runway they just taken off on and they ended up about a mile short and the uh, uh by that time the the, the uh, rescue crews on the base had been more had been notified and they were summoned and they just got as fast as they could down to where the crash site was covered it with some foam covered the aircraft with foam uh put out the uh, whatever fire was there and at the end of the day, everybody lived. Oh, everybody lived. It's right. a, a miracle. The, uh, that's the good news. Bad news is there are several communities around the Air Force Base that have uh, uh, P4, PFAS pollution in their water. And uh, I remember another time when I was a naval flight officer stationed out in uh, Moffettville, California, uh, close to Palo Alto, and I'm driving to work one morning. Uh, and I didn't have done early flights, so it's about 8 o'clock in the morning driving down 101 to uh, the base and uh, the uh, I could see black smoke coming up from my base off in the distance. They had no idea what was going on. We got closer and closer. I went in the gate, main gate, and the, the um, uh, person at the main gate, uh, the guard said, there, we had a, a crash here. He said, it's, hey, we have it but off the field. We have uh, uh, NOAA uh, and NASA, rather NASA aircraft, big airplanes. And we have the P3s, which are pretty big four-engine airplanes, but not as big as the NASA planes. And we have dual runways, like so the parallel runways, so you can have two airplanes landing side by side with it on different runways. And the air traffic controller uh, made a, a human error, and he allowed the uh, the large uh, NASA plane to literally land on top of the Navy plane. Uh, I think 18 people died. 
And uh, during that, as me, immediately when the crash occurred, uh, the rescue trucks came out and they sprayed down the, the aircraft to save as many people as they could. And there's an irony here that the, the uh, chemical ingredients that were used to try to save lives in both of those uh, crews have now threatened lives in terms of the drinking water that we have. And the question is, and this has occurred, especially in military bases around the country and also at airports, we have a lot of groundwater contamination. The question is, what do you do about it? How do we clean it up? Who's gonna pay for that? What kind of standards are gonna be set for what uh, is safe? How, what is the levels for uh, the presence of these chemicals in our water? What is safe and, and we're able to drink? And not have to worry about uh, damaging our health. So that, that these are the kinds of issues that, that we get to deal with. And the uh, capital is a huge leader on this stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to uh, to help uh, with that. And that's just an example, real life example from right here of what can, can happen uh, with uh, creating uh, hazards for, for our drinking water. In, uh, in Delaware, I think I said one out of six uh, Delawareans uh, depend on uh, a well. For, for the drinking water. That would be about 170, 175,000 people in all. And they use uh, private wells. They don't have access to public water water system. Some of the communities here at Dover, near, nearby Dover Air Force Base that have uh, seen their groundwater uh, polluted by PFAS, uh, are now getting access to public water, and which is a good, uh, good thing. The private well contamination affects uh, all kinds of folks, including low-income folks. The most uh, because they can't afford home filtration systems in many instances that eliminate pollutions, including nitrates. We have a lot of nitrate pollution. By, and, and, and in Southern Delaware, we raise all these chickens. Mm -hmm. have, I think I said earlier, we have, uh, I think, uh, 300 chickens for every person in Delaware. That's a good thing. We sell a lot of chickens around the world. They also create a lot of manure, and the, which is a high, uh, a high uh, phosphorus, high nitrogen uh, fertilizer. But if you put too much on the land, it, uh, it can seep into the groundwater and then even to our surface water. So that's, uh, that's a challenge as, as well. Nitrates is a, is a real problem for us. The question I would have, this is really for the whole panel, uh, if I could, uh, what more can Congress and the federal government do to ensure safe, clean water for individuals who rely on private wells for their drinking water? Uh, Rick, would you like to take that one first? What more can Congress and the federal government do to ensure safe, clean water for individuals who rely on private wells for the drinking water? Rural water works with all, all entities, uh, whether it be private, uh, municipal, uh, and so forth. So, it, and at the end of the day, it's, uh, we're there to help provide clean, safe, potable drinking water. Uh, we often get calls um, at rural water about you know nitrates in water and stuff like how we can uh, rectify the problem and so forth. So you know we work closely with the Office of Drinking Water and they offer different uh, test kits and so forth. So uh, uh, we also have as members of the, the Rural Water Association in Delaware members who have units that can kind of abstract the nitrates and so forth and, and provide that service like that. So. Uh, um, we feel that we do a, a, a fantastic job you know, working with the ones that are uh, having nitrate issues. I know we can't catch them all, but uh, there are ways to resolve and help work through the nitrate problems and so forth. So, uh, um, but it is going to happen. You know, in Delaware, you know, we are farmland, so like that so. Um, I think with uh, additional funding and so forth uh, to help eliminate some of these and corrective actions and so forth and come up with programs, uh, we can uh, conquer the problem. So. Thank you. Uh, Vicki, same question. What more can Congress uh, and the federal government do to ensure safe, clean water for individuals who rely on uh, for uh, wells on their, for their drinking water? Thank you for the question, Senator Crocker. Um, first, I'd like to say that um, there is a private well, for private well owners, there's the private well class. Uh, there's also the National Groundwater Association that provides technical assistance along with RCAP and our many um, programs and uh, CERCAP uh, within the state of Delaware. It's important to um, private well owners um, that they understand uh, their well. Um, we offer private well uh, assessments that we come out to their home and can show them where their well is located, um, print out the information from DENREC, um, giving them the depths 
um, when it was installed um, and, and educate them on the ways that their well could be contaminated um, by visually looking at the wellhead and advising them on what should be there and what shouldn't. Um, I think it's critical that continued funding um, for these programs um, continue. Um, the contamination issue with their, if, if they do have a broken septic, if they have a leaking septic and understand that those, the, the, the septic tank being a disrepair um, can affect their drinking water is very important. Um, nitrates, you know, they, it's not something that you can see, you can't smell it. They don't know that it, you know, it's in their water and they think that if it tastes good, it smells good, it looks good, then it's good. It's great water and that's not necessarily the truth. And they think if something is contaminated that boiling it can get rid of that contamination and we know with nitrates that boiling it concentrates the nitrates. Um, so I think education is so important and continued funding to technical assistance programs like SERCAP and RCAP is very important. All right, thank you. Uh, same same I, question. I wholeheartedly agree with your panelists. I think offering um, a more robust system for well rehabilitation services, providing um, more public health led programs for provision of education, right, for um, families who are um, well owners, education and tools and resources to support them. I believe the funding that Senator Capito mentioned will go a long way um, as well in helping to support um, our private well owners in our state. I, uh, I could be mistaken on this. I, I've asked John Kane, uh, who's our lead uh, staff member on, on EPW, with respect to uh, to water issues, to, to check with our, our team. But I, I believe the last time I checked, here in Delaware, we have a Department of Health and Social Services, and Lisa used to be the uh, Deputy Secretary of that uh, that department so after he, uh, when she was a member of the administration. And, uh, but we have within the Department of Health and Social Services, there's a division of, of public health, and I think we have the capability, the Division of Public Health has the capability to provide for a couple of dollars uh, the testing of, of water, uh, that's uh, drinking water that for folks who don't have a public system. What do we have? Four dollars, yeah, four dollars. Four dollars. Four dollars. And uh, pretty, good, pretty good price for a lot of, uh, lot of uh, certainty and, and uh, reassurance. Uh, this question, let's see. Sandra, had you finished? I think you had. Yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Rick, I'm gonna come back to you if I could. Uh, you were, you, the issue, and I'm sure uh, Senator Capitol remembers it, the, the issue of worker retention, worker retraining uh, keeps coming up. We just had uh, uh, earlier this week uh, a celebration down in, uh, in um, Georgetown, which is the county seat of our southernmost county, Sussex County. And at uh, Del Tech, which is one of the finest uh, community colleges in, in America, uh, we, uh, had the dedication of his uh, Automotive uh, Center for Excellence. And it was a, a partnership between uh, Dell Tech, which is largely state sponsored. Uh, the, uh, there's money that was literally, the idea was to create folk, or to train people who can fix cars, trucks, vans, big cars, you know, big trucks, and smaller ones as well. And eventually they'll be uh, trained to, to work on electric powered vehicles, and maybe eventually after that hydrogen powered vehicles. But uh, the, um, the, the, uh, one of the challenges that our automotive dealers in the state have had for years is finding enough trained uh, workers to uh, take care of uh, the vehicles and make sure that they, they're they working. And, and uh, they, uh, I remember going into a, an auto dealership down just about 20 miles south of here in the town of Milford uh, about 10 years ago. We got the first Chevrolet Volt. So we had a press conference. I wanted people to know we had a, uh, an electric vehicle was the hybrid, and I want people to know about that. So we did a great press event on that. Then I went and did a tour of the uh, of the uh, the shops, the repair shops. It was a Saturday, and the uh, the, the fellow who owned IG Burden said uh, one of our biggest challenges is just having people trained who come here and work, do this work, and uh, uh, we lose them. And I said, well, maybe we should pay him more money. And he said. Uh, I said it had with only, you know, uh, joking, but he said, we started, we paid people to start, this was a decade ago, he said 30, 40,000. He said one one person would pay almost $100,000 is to be a technician on fixed cars. And uh, I said, well, that's a lot. But as it turns out, almost every auto dealer had the same problem. 
had the same problem. Our uh, pulse integrators had the same problem. And what we've done is create this partnership with Deltec, state, county, um, the uh, something called Economic Development Administration, an entity that's Center of Capital and I work with very closely. We have jurisdiction over them. And they uh, invest in projects just like this, just like that one. And uh, it's a, it's a, a but what, uh, what we had to do for the auto dealers, for the poultry integrators, is make sure they had a workforce. Make sure they had a workforce. And it wasn't that the workforce was aging. They, they just didn't have, they just couldn't keep them. They just couldn't keep them. We have a similar problem all over the country, I hear, with worker retention. And we've got a bunch of these uh, small utilities, and some of them have just one employee, maybe a couple. And they, uh, they, they're not getting any younger, like some of my colleagues in the Senate. I mentioned Chuck Wesley earlier. He's 88. He's going to run for election. And uh, I think uh, Diane Feinstein's 88. Uh, and who else is 88? Uh, Richard Shelby. And I told Chuck Grassley when he announced he was going to run for the election, I said, well, when I'm 88, I'm not going to be running for re election. And I said, I just hope I know who I am, where I am. And I'll be happy with that. But uh, retention, workforce retention, uh, each other year. If you give us some thoughts on that, Rick, why don't you lead us off? 380,000 water wastewater operators throughout the country. 30 to 50 percent will be retiring within the next five to 10 years. Um, these operators serve as public health officials and are often only persons responsible for complying with all the applicable federal, state drinking water, clean water act regulations for supplying the small communities and safe drinking water and sanitation every second of the day. Again, unfortunately, a vast majority of the Delaware small community water systems have been unable to attract train and retain the next generation workforce due to the lack of path, career path coupled by low salary levels and population density. At Delaware Rural Water, we've seen this need to act quickly and partner with the National Rural Water and the Delaware Department of Labor to initiate our water and wastewater systems operator apprenticeship program back in 2019. And we were very proud to work to address this urgent need. In fact, we just had our first graduating class this past spring. Delaware Rural Water Apprenticeship Program leverages workforce development activities, including path, career path and modern somatic apprentice models for 4,000 hours of on-the-job training at a work at a water or wastewater system, 288 hours of formal classroom training and instruction, and additional guidance from Delaware's subject matter. Some of the benefits uh, operators get uh, for our apprenticeship program include expanded job opportunities in rural America by including access to pre-apprenticeship, youth outreach, and mentorship programs. We've established a systematic training method for water and wastewater utilities. We've also improved the workforce participation and retention of work, water workers in small communities. We certify our water workers' proficiency with an identifiable career path. We've modernized the water industry's approach to workforce development. We also enhance professionalism and upskill the incumbent worker, increase the recognition of the public benefit that water and wastewater systems deliver to the communities. And we always work with employers on schedule of wage increases, and it's to provide the sophisticated and advanced technologies these system operators need every day. So we're proud of our apprenticeship programs and working with the Department of Labor here in Delaware. Can I just ask a quick question? I'm going to jump in real quick. How many people have you had go through that program? We've got 20 in our apprenticeship program now. Yeah. And how do you recruit them? Uh, we have our apprenticeship coordinator go out to uh, municipalities. Uh, we work with our career path, our pathways people, so forth. Um, we do a lot of advertising, TV advertising, so forth. You want to change your career, you want a new path in life. Uh, we, we go out and research and we just, you know, we just put the information out there that, you know, uh, we're, we're getting ready, we're starting our vet program up, you know, where we're doing apprenticeship for vets mm -hmm. coming back so forth. So, uh, uh, it's uh, a lot of it's word of mouth, but we're all got uh, in the municipalities, communities, uh, doing uh, job fairs and so forth like that. So, thanks. For, for anybody, uh, and with respect to retention, we have a uh, a lot of uh, utilities, really small, many of them have one employee, one or two employees. Um, and in some places there, we're seeing a consolidation, maybe almost a merger between small utilities. And, and is, is that part of the answer to worker retention to give them the ability to actually pay more money? Uh, is that part of part of what needs to be done or can't, can help or address this problem? 
for core courses in Delaware, um, most urban municipalities have more than one. Uh, we do have some uh, what we call circuit rider uh, water operators that yeah. take care of multiple systems and so forth. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, let me ask the or other way. Any, any thoughts on on uh, work, work retention, any workforce retention? If, if you don't have anything for us on this, there are plenty of other questions we have. So, but anything you want to mention? Workforce retention, going, going. I'll, yeah, go ahead. I just want to. I just you know want to say that the infrastructure that Delaware has built with our pathways programs, right, in our schools is a really good opportunity, right, to look at. Um, growing economies and places, right, where we need um, um, additional um, expertise for the long run and to actually start to engage um, with these schools really early, right, start to engage with, um, with youth really early for them to understand that there are different career paths, right, that they can have an opportunity to engage with that, um, you know, a college degree, right, um, may not be the pathway for everyone and to expose them to uh, other opportunities, so I'm really happy to hear that this program exists in, in Delaware and Delaware Rural Water is doing this and hope that there's an opportunity to spread and scale it. Yeah. Not everybody needs to go to college, as you know, not everybody. And uh, sometimes we think you got to go to college in order to get a good job. Not true. Not true. And some of the, the jobs are most in demand pay well, but don't don't require a four year degree, may not require a two year associate's degree. Uh, Dell Tech, because our uh, community college uh, here in Delaware, they have something called the SEED program. And for folks who, like, students who have like a B, a B minus average or something coming out of high school, they, right after graduation from high school, they end up, they can take advantage of the SEED uh, scholarship and go to, uh, for a two-year college free, free. And a lot of them can get a certificate. If they get an associate's degree, they can get a certificate that can be transferable and used around the uh, state, around the country. The uh, uh, but that's that's the uh, the other thing. And a couple of our witnesses have mentioned the Pathways Program. Uh, when Jack McKellar, Jack McKellar is our governor, mm -hmm. uh, a very good governor. I'd like to say he was one of the two or three best governors we ever had. Uh, but uh, the uh, I wish you were here to say that. <laughs> but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, they uh, they uh, launched in his administration was pathway program. So we got all our kids graduating from high school. Some are going to go to two-year college. Some are going to go to um, you know, four-year college. Some will go in the military, and some will just wonder, well, what do I do now? And uh, the idea of the pathways program was to create 20, 25 pathways for students to literally start working out throughout their time in high school. We started, I think, with 27 kids in the first year that we did it, now we've got about 25,000, which may not sound like a lot, but in Little Delaware, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of students, and it's, so we're very proud of that program. Yes, I'd sir. just like to comment that I wrote a 12-week program uh, and took it into the Indian River High School District and, and talked with the, with the career pass coordinator, and she provided me with 10 students. Uh, by the time we ended the 12 week, we were down to eight students, uh, taking those on field trips and so forth, and giving them exams, having the municipality, uh, city managers come in, public works directors quiz these kids while they're taking tours, and every one of them were on spot with the 12 week. And we're proud to say that upon graduation, three of these students were hired by municipalities as soon as they graduated, and two in the wastewater field, one's in the water field now. So we're, we're proud of uh, that work that we did there in the schools. And like I said, we just started this program up at the William Penn High School uh, starting this week. So we're proud of that. So. William Penn High School is the largest high school in Delaware, yes. focused in some college. All right, uh, Sun Capital, I have a couple more questions, but uh, why don't you take it over? Yeah, I, I have one final question for everybody. Uh, when we, I talked about resilience in, in a little bit in my um, opening statement, um, you know, infrastructure ne needs to be resilient in terms of being able to withstand extreme weather events, whether it's climate change or something like that. I'm sure being on the coast, your weather events are different than ours, um, but I think it can encompass more of that in terms of resiliency. So um, we can start over here with, uh, I'll just call you Cassandra if that's okay. Um, uh, you know, when you think about the different stressors that can test a water system's resiliency, what stressors are at the forefront, and especially with uh, with respect to protecting our public health? So, um, 
you know, there are many stressors, you know, that we can think of. So things like, you know, more frequent storms, right, due to climate change. Um, um, you know, I think that's a big thing here with us seeing more and more frequent um, mm -hmm. storms and the, and the unpredictability of those storms um, is, um, and then and then the issues that then um, occur um, as it relates to um, our water systems as a, as a result, right? right? Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought about. Yeah, yep, as a result of as a result of those storms. So, um, you know, I think um, from a public health perspective, um, really working to equip right communities with the tools that they need to actually be able to be more resilient. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to these storms. Um, recently, um, you may have heard Senator Capito that here in our great state, just in Wilmington, due to Hurricane Ida, right, um, we are still dealing with and still mm -hmm. reeling from um, the floodwaters that um, have damaged over 200 homes, right, in the city of Wilmington. Um, and, um, and there are then additional repercussions as it relates, right, to the water system um, in, those, in those communities. So so we really do need, from a public health perspective and also from an infrastructure perspective, mm -hmm. right? I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, for, for us, looking at Wilmington, I think it's more, it's an infrastructure perspective mm -hmm. first, um, really being able to identify those neighborhoods that need, that have, that need um, better drainage systems, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To be built like yesterday, um, that will then support um, their public health needs in the long term. Thank you. Ms. Prettyman? Thank you for the question, Senator Capita. Um, I, with Aaliyah, the the requirement was 3,300 in population above. You needed to have your risk resilient assessment and your emergency response plan. Um, most municipalities, um, right at that 3,000 population, may not have the staff to be mm -hmm. able to complete those. Um, and so, I think technical assistance providers mm -hmm. being able to come in and assist them is very important. Um, but also the population below 3,000, the smaller systems still see the same issues, right. um, intense rain events, flooding. Uh, so I think it's important that we be able to also provide them with that assistance um, to do a, a short form type of risk and resilience assessment. Um, COVID showed us a lot uh, about where um, some municipalities fall short, especially with the uh, municipalities that have only that one operator. And if that operator fell sick with COVID, um, you know, it, it was it was hard to be able to maintain um, the testing that is required to be done on a daily basis or if something were to happen uh, with the drinking water. So understanding where you're, you're more vulnerable at um, is very important and we need to educate our municipalities and, and I believe even the smaller ones below the 3,000 is very important for them to be able to do that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Duncan? We've been working with risk and resilience for 31 years since I've been there. Mm -hmm. Every water system is under some type of risk and has some type of uh, resistance. Uh, res uh, uh, Towns in the north have different issues, uh, have different risks than our coastal towns. You know, we in the coastal side, we deal with uh, saltwater intrusion, you know, we monitor that. And in the north, we have the PFAS more heavily than we do in the southern part. So um, we work with the uh, water system very close and making sure they're up to date on their uh, uh, EPA guidelines and so forth. They follow the criteria and make sure they're um, reporting those forms and so forth. But we also want to make sure they have their emergency response plans up to date. So you got to have those. So, and, but in doing that, you have to maintain that data. You know, like we're saying, that 30 to 50 percent of the workforce is retiring. So the next operator to come in may not have that knowledge of completing a risk resilience uh, program. So uh, providing technical assistance is, is a plus. We gotta have those providers out there working with these systems, making sure they understand the rules and regulations of risk and resilience. So well, thank you. I think I, I will say my anecdotal story is living in Charleston, West Virginia. We had a chemical, you'll remember this maybe, 
massive chemical spill into our our main uh, water uh, provider and of about 600,000 people and affected my own home. And, you know, when you've lived through something like that, you really realize, number one, what's the emergency plan? Well, I'm not sure we really knew what that was. Uh, what is this chemical that has been spilled into our water and what kind of health effects does it have? Didn't have that answer. And it goes really to the question you're saying. You need to pre-identify your risks. I mean, this chemical tank that leaked was an eighth of a mile up river from the intake. I mean, somebody should have been able, you know, that should have, they should have known that. And you would think they would ask the question, what's in those tanks and what could possibly. Right. And honestly, we had, um, it, it ended up to not be a, a, a big health issue uh, as much as you, know, you could smell it in your water. Um, and so it, be just, it just erodes your confidence, even though maybe yeah, I'm not gonna drink this water that's smelling like this. And, and even though they say, oh, go ahead, you can take a shower. Well, you know, who wants to shower in licorice smelling water that you're not really sure what it is. So I think all the, all the answers that you've put forward uh, after having lived through an experience like that, I think you're right on it. It's just enacting it. And I do agree with when you get into the smaller systems, it is hard. For people so a short form you know maybe that's that's a that's the answer there to help them and then obviously more technical expertise as they go along but thank you that's the end of my questions all right i have one more uh, quick question and this will be for you vicky and i just ask you to take just a minute or two uh you could probably spend the afternoon uh, talking about it but I, I don't want you to do that just take a couple of minutes and uh tell us a little bit more about the ongoing work related to pfas contamination in, uh, in delaware how the contamination has impacted communities, especially small communities with limited resources. I'm, we're especially interested in your personal perspective in dealing with these contaminants in the blades uh, just a couple of years ago. Just keep it brief, but just give, give us those thoughts. Thank you. Oh, well, you're right. I probably could talk to you about it. First, the impact that PFAS has on a community can be devastating. Um, and I do want to thank you and your team for being there um, in our time of crisis. Um, it, it indeed was a learn on the fly experience. I had never heard of PFAS prior to, um, to being told by the EPA that it's present in your drinking water and you're well above the um, HAL. Um, it, it, it was, you know, a lot of learning about, um, again, this was several years ago, so we know a lot more now, um, but what this um, filtration system, um, what would work best with the, the, the existing plant. Um, we had so many questions. Um, do we interconnect with our, um, with Seaford? Um, do we, um, Will the machine, will the filtration system that we did go with be built and delivered on time? Um, the components um, and the equipment that's needed to install it. So it was a lot of questions. Um, and we were very fortunate to have a municipality from up north um, that had recently been through it come down and assist. They even lent the town um, hoses to connect for the filtration system to the, you know, to the existing plant. Um, my, it was great that the state was there and we were able to get HISCA funds to assist with the financial side, you know, the um, filtration system cost well over $300,000 to purchase, ship it, install it. Um, but could you imagine um, that on a, a municipality of 1,500 with a 20, more than 22% poverty rate, um, the operations and maintenance costs that it, it will be, I had mentioned earlier that it was over $30,000 to replace the media. And when you're first at it, you don't know if that media needs to be re uh, replaced every three years or every six years. So there's testing that has to be done several times a year in order to see how that media is, is taking out the PFAS. Um, and so those expenses are incurred on a municipality, and it simply isn't fair for a municipality of that size um, or any municipality to have to bear the cost 
of those testing of the media replacement and um, the disposal of the media because it has to be disposed of a hazardous material. So there's all that cost that's involved. Um, the citizens should not bear the burden of that financial um, situation. Um, and we need to make the polluters pay. So that's my. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for those words. Uh, let me uh, close uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this. Uh, Senator Capito and I work with uh, every Democrat and Republican member of our committee, all 20 of us, to write legislation uh, dealing with clean uh, drinking water, wastewater treatment, and um, a variety of other infrastructures, roads, highways, bridges, and on and on and on. We uh, reported out the legislation unanimously out of committee. The full Senate uh, passed the legislation 89 to 2. That provided the, uh, the really the building block on which the uh, rest of the uh, infrastructure package was loaded. And while all this was going on, Senator Capito was negotiating with the President of the United States, my right for in, in Delaware, to, uh, to try to find common ground between the Congress and the administration on uh, in infrastructure issues. And I think she, uh, on, through her personal efforts, really helped to create an environment where a, uh, a consensus could be developed in the Senate that led to a uh, 69 and I think the 30 vote in favor of very broad bipartisan infrastructure package that includes the water issues that we're talking about. The, uh, that legislation is over in the House now. And they, uh, they uh, were waiting for a negotiation to bear fruit uh, between mm -hmm. Senator Manchin from West Virginia mm -hmm. and um, um, maybe a couple of others. And uh, the leader of the House, Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. see if we can't find agreement on uh, the second piece of another package, a related package called reconciliation that, that, that helps families in a lot of good ways, uh, focuses on climate change. But they've got to have agreement on that piece so we can move forward. We got to get this infrastructure bill passed. There's a great, great need in West Virginia in this state and 48 other states as well. And the legislation that we've developed and have literally waiting to go in the House it would change lives, save lives. And there's a great sense of urgency for that. And uh, we want to just uh, underscore that here here today. Uh, I just really want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your life's work. Thank you for your caring about the people of, of this state and other states as, as well. And uh, keep up uh, keep up the good, uh, good work. Before we adjourn a little bit of housekeeping, I want to ask the unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders and other materials that relate to today's hearings. And when you ask for the unanimous consent, you listen to see if anybody's going to object. Nobody's going to object. <laughs> Here we go. So we're good to go. Additionally, the senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on Friday, October 29th. And we will compile those questions. We'll send them to our witnesses. We ask our witnesses to reply by Friday, November the 12th. In closing, again, we want to thank all of you for your testimony, for response to our questions, the work that you do, and for doing um, so much for the people of, of, of our state to provide for them uh, essential uh, utility services and really to provide for them uh, life, life and health. Uh, can't do much more for people than, than that, so thank you. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned against uh, Senator Capito. Thank you. I want to thank you, Seth, uh, John Kane, John, would you raise your hand? And the other members of, uh, of our team, John Kane's team, anybody else here? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Travis, would you just raise, raise your hand? And, and, and Jess and Will. Jeff, Jess and Will, would you guys raise your hand, please? Thank you so much. Uh, this is a team that works together. We're workforces. We're proud to be able to serve all of you, our states, and the rest of this country. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.